We have lead paint in our old houses. You know, when I, I work because when they say we're going to do an environmental assessment, and they think, oh, that's a good, that's an idea of the environmental assessment, good thought, thought. And when you say, I'm going to do an environmental assessment on an old house, people are like, oh, that means you're going to find all the bad stuff, the asbestos and lead paint and things that old houses used to be made of. We've got to deal with that. So we've got to get smarter about the lead paint issue, managing it in place, lead safe work practices. Lead paint isn't jumping off the walls at us, but it does get eroded and wear and tear, and so it's a real health issue, and we collectively are the stewards of this issue. Our housing stock has this. I got started in this because a friend of mine was restoring their house, and they lead poisoned their daughter. This was 15 years ago, because we didn't know as much about it. We know a lot more about it. Lead paint in historic buildings is a publication of our office, and it will go online this year with a new preamble as we ramp up education and training on that issue. Here's a simple little thought about lead safety. It's about lead dust, not the actual paint itself. So our goal is to reduce lead dust in the environment, around our houses, on the floors, on the windowsills, by doing proper maintenance when we do things. But you don't have to have the guys in total zoot suits, and it's not like asbestos. It's not like it's easily airborne. It's more a containment and control. So face mask, scraping, wet misting, containment. I'm oversimplifying this, but it's not that complicated, but we need to get the contractors trained on lead safe work practices, and that's what we've done. Green, green cleaning products are taking off. Everybody, if you go to the store and you look, they're putting the green color on it and removing. So it's getting easier and easier to find these kind of things for our household tasks that we do in maintaining our properties and our commercial properties as well as our homeowners. And then obviously, all the green rating systems have a benchmark of recycling, having that as part of the program, does your community recycle? It's seen as kind of a standard, you know, there are some benefits to this, but I also think that this may be taking a lot of people's time that's not as well spent if we, you know, having a recycling bin in front of a teardown, you know, it's kind of my you know, irony, right? You know, we tore the whole house down, but we're still recycling because we're doing the little stuff. So let's talk about the big stuff, too. Now, here's one of my favorites. The solar clothes dryer. Cost eight bucks. What a marketing genius that is, right? Did you know that these are illegal in many parts of our country? And that modern subdivision ordinances often prohibit clotheslines? So what's it going to be? We're going to buy an eco, let's see, if we had an electric hair dryer, or electric clothes dryer, we need like $20,000 worth of solar panels to make electricity to run. So that's what the green industry is telling us. Well, let's get these $20,000. And here's the simple technology-free old solution, free solar clothes dryer. But they don't hold king-size sheets. Right. <laughs> the market so we're there. Ramp up this with a new technology for supersizing for our supersized bed. And actually, where you really need to go on this is the new washing machines with the super spin cycle that get most of the water out of the stuff before it goes to the dryer. That's a highly efficient new technology. But here's an old technology: plentiful, readily available solar, and yet it's not highly marketed as the green solution. And your patio chairs can be yeah. yeah. Now, here's one you probably weren't ready for, the fireplace. The fireplace is attacked in some of these green rating systems because the traditional open hearth fireplace is incredibly wasteful of energy. You lose more energy getting sucked up through the flue than you gain from the heat and the environmental air quality of the smoke in the room from that. So there's actually, some of the green rating systems give you points for not having a fireplace. So here we have this icon of tradition getting a green negative spin that, you know, this is not good for us, or if you're going to build it, you've got to build these really complicated ones. I will tell you that our ancestors, they used the parlor stove, and that's what this view is. Here's a 19th century house with its <coughs> parlor stove in front of the fireplace. They never used the fireplace for heat. They knew, from Ben Franklin's time on, they knew that wasn't an efficient way to make heat. It's just been a romantic device that we've had. But if you wanted heat, you put a metal stove in it and you stuck the fluid from it, because that was a better, more efficient way to use it as a heating thing. But our culture has embedded this. I mean, how many of you have been in the office? I'm going to show you it's got seven fireplaces. It's got it's like, we have made this a benchmark, and it's a big deal in these new McMansions, too, the humongous fireplace at the end of the great room. So here's a cultural problem. We have identified the fireplace as the heart when it's really the microwave, because that's really where most of the food comes from. 
So we got a cultural divide on this one. What's green, what's not, you know, keep it as an ornament, put a television set in there and whatever. <laughs> I have seen it done. <laughs> wait, wait, a little difficulty on this one. Now, save energy for less, because energy is the biggest topic of green behavior in the residential marketplace. But as this chart shows, space heating is only 31%. A lot of what our energy use is operating the stuff and equipment in our houses. It's not just heating and cooling the house, which might be a third or maybe a half of our energy use. So there's a lot of different things we're going to deal with when we talk about energy. And there are conflicting standards of energy efficiency. So the green systems are trying to sort this out, but there's, we're getting some consensus. And in terms of making your building more energy efficient, there's dealing with the building envelope, which is the space heating and cooling issue, better insulation. And then there's the equipment in there and how it operates. When we saw the previous presentation, talked about motion sensors for lights when they're on and off, when we need daylight. Well, our old houses are pretty good. We have lots of natural daylight. We, we understood when we built houses 100 years ago to put enough windows to wall to have daylight during the day. And we can make the changes in the equipment that are not going to affect the historic character. Largely, the equipment improvements are efficiency gains that we can easily adopt for older buildings. But the first premise I'm going to start with is that the most efficient thing you do first is the energy you avoided by investing in efficiency first. You don't start by putting solar panels on the house. You start by going, where does it leak? How do I deal with the airflow through the building? How do I avoid wasting the energy that I'm already using through efficiency gains? Whether it's doors, windows, floors, there's lots of places where our houses and our old houses have leakage problems. Now, if you're